read. Pick up a book and read. Open up the cover and read. Read all the words inside. Read. Travel to a place and read. Open up your mind and read. Read, read, everyone read. Read. Pick up a book and read. Open up the cover and read. Read all the words inside. Read. Travel to a place and read. Open up your mind and read. Read, read, everyone read. Okay, this time you have to say read. Here we go. Read. Pick up a book and read. Open up the cover and read. Read all the words inside. Read. Travel to a place and read. Open up your mind and read. Read, read, everyone read. Read, 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 everyone read. It's Miss Kingsmill at St. Tammany Parish Public Schools, kindergarten teacher, and today I'm going to be reading for you what the sleepy animals do at the Audubon Zoo. This story was written by Grace Millsaps and Ryan Murphy, and the illustrations are by John Clark and Allison Kilday. What the sleepy animals do at the Audubon Zoo. Renee and her dad went to Audubon Zoo to see tigers and tree frogs and tortoises too. She ate Roman candy and scaled Monkey Hill. She climbed the live oaks. It was all quite a thrill. But Renee knew the zoo was not what she thought. Something was missing and she missed it a lot. The animals were not doing animal things like roaring, galloping, and flapping their wings. The lions were lazy and the snakes just snored. The dolphins were drowsy and the boars were a bore. Dad asked Renee, sitting in the cafe, why were the animals sleeping all day? Well, said her dad and he paused and he thought, they sleep in the day, because at night they do not. Why, said Renee, would they not go to bed? Because, said her dad, they have parties instead. While we are asleep, they all come out and giggle and wiggle and frolic about. The Wild Hearts Jazz Band can be heard through the place. The Aardvark plays trumpet, the Sloth plays the bass. The Pandas come out wearing all of their bling and everyone dances and does their own thing. Which one do you dance like? The Hippos Hip Hop, the Flamingos Flamenco, the rhinos rock out, the tarantulas chango. The sea lion sometimes will synchronize swim. There's a costume contest and everyone wins. The best one at limbo is the white alligator. And when they get hungry, the pelicans cater. Yes, it's dark, but who needs the sun for pinning the tail on the zookeeper fun? Each night they crown a new carnival king as speeches and toast and cheers loudly ring. Then someone will call for the hokey pokey, which usually ends in karaoke. So kangaroos belt out some Sir Elton John as leopards and lions roar roughly along. They're having a second line. And look at that. The Grand Marshal is the tiger. And just when they're all feeling very content, the sun starts to rise and they must take the hint. They each brush their teeth and they comb out their coats. The garbage is cleaned by the hungriest goats. The band puts their instruments back in their cases and everyone rushes to get in their places. The guard opens the doors and the people come in and wouldn't you know it, they're tired by then. 
Dad, Renee said as she finished her meal, that story's too silly, it just can't be real. I'll admit, said her father, I can't prove what goes on, but trust me, my child, I can tell when they yawn. Yawn. Looks like Renee's a little tired too. Then they stood and they stretched and they started to leave as the sun slowly sank behind tall tangled trees. But she saw an old chimp when they walked to their car and he gave her a wink as he tuned a guitar. The end. I hope you enjoyed reading what the sleepy animals do at the Audubon Zoo. Bye guys. Welcome to the Audubon Insectarium and Butterfly Garden in downtown New Orleans. We are going to take you inside and behind the scenes to get up close and personal with thousands of bugs. We have about 70 live animal exhibits, and most of them are not what we call mixed species exhibits, so there's those 70. And then we have animals that we can bring out at presentation areas, uh, which include probably about 20 or 30 different species. So we've got 100 before you get into the butterfly exhibit. And in there, there's usually 25 to 35 species on any given day. So I usually say you can see over 100 species of live arthropods when you come to a visit here. But before you and the larva get to the garden, it all starts in the metamorphosis room. A caterpillar turning into a butterfly or a moth would be the classic example that everyone knows about. But uh, ants, bees, and wasps go through this metamorphosis. There's a larval stage for all of those insects. The Butterfly Garden is home to hundreds of butterflies. This little serene sanctuary flutters with life as butterflies fly from flower to flower. The serenity of this Asian-inspired garden is by design. There's a special tree here, and a special tree here, and a special shrub there, and it isn't overgrown like a rainforest. So an Asian garden is unique among, among U.S. butterfly exhibits, and it was also practical because we made our landlords happy by keeping certain features of the building open with an Asian garden. But the insectarium is not just home to butterflies. There are hundreds of other species, including some that you can eat. Insects are an important source of protein in many cultures and a culinary delight if cooked correctly. But we can't eat all the bugs because if they disappear, so do we. I always tell people, if there were no tigers and no whales in the world, it would be very sad. And, you know, if we have anything to do with it as humans, uh, we should try very hard to save those animals. But if they were gone, we, as humans, as a species, we'd be fine. We can get along on this planet without tigers and whales. You pull insects out of the equation, terrestrial ecosystems collapse in a couple of months, and we have a legitimate catastrophe on our hands. So, we need the bugs. Whether you fly solo or you bring your love bug, the Insectarium is a great place to learn and have fun. Oh. And fly from flower to flower. Inside and behind the scenes to get to get up close and per hey, yeah.
and talented actress has arrived. I'm ready for my script, director. All right, your first line is, a monster is attacking the city. Action! The city is being attacked by monsters. Cut! What was that? Acting? No. Look at the punctuation mark at the end of this sentence. It's a... An exclamation point. It's an exclamation point. It means something exciting or scary is happening. It means being loud. It should have been said like this. A monster is attacking the city. You see what I did with my voice there? Stunning work. Just, just, we'll move on to the next line. What you're gonna say next is, what should we do? Ready, set, action. What should we do? Cut! It's not an exclamation point anymore. It's a... Um... Question mark. It's a question mark now. You use it whenever you ask a question. If you want to find out something, you need to know the answer to something, you use a question mark. It should sound like this. <clears throat> what should we do? See? Oh, I get it. A question mark. Like, what goes at the end of my questions? Like, how's my hair? Or where's my mocha frappuccino? We're just gonna move on to the last line. What you're gonna say is, we should call the police. Action! We should call the police? Cut! It's not a question. There's not a question mark at the end. It's a period. It goes at the end of a telling sentence. You're telling someone something. It should have sounded like this. We should call the police. I'm telling you something. The sky is blue, period. I have a dog, period. I'm feeling a little angry, period. It goes at the end of a telling sentence. I'm telling you something. Punctuation is so important. It tells us what the sentence sounds like or what we're doing. A monster is attacking the city. Exclamation point. I'm yelling. I'm exclaiming something exciting. What should we do? I'm asking a question. A question mark. We should call the police. A period. I'm telling you something. You see? You get it? Sounds like punctuation is pretty important. <sighs> yes. Punctuation is important. Somebody go get me a coffee. I'm so excited to be here with you today. 
Today is Wednesday, March 25th, 2020. I'm here today to do the problem of the day. During the problem of the day, we are going to explore a math problem and try to solve it or find the answer. If you would like to work with me, all you need is a piece of paper and something to write with, and you can work with me. Our very first problem is going to help us learn how to count in different ways. We're going to practice counting. The problem says, I found three pots of gold. Each pot had 10 coins in it. How many coins did I have in all? Now, let's think about what this problem is saying, and we're going to make a model or a drawing to help us solve it. So what did it say first? That's right. I found three pots of gold. To help us solve it, why don't we draw the three pots? Now, I'm going to draw the pots by using a rectangle laying on its long side and then a circle at the bottom. But you can draw your pots however you want. Be as creative as you like. So let's start by drawing the three pots of gold. Help me count while we're doing this. There's one pot, two pots, and three pots. Let's count them one more time to make sure we have three. One, two, three. Okay, now did you draw your pots too? Can you hold them up for me to see? Those look fantastic. Now that I've drawn my three pots, I'm having trouble remembering what came next in the problem. Can you help me remember? Oh, that's right. I have 10 coins in each pot. So I guess, let's see. Now I need to draw the coins in each pot. So you can draw them with me. I'm just going to use a circle because I know that coins are always in a circle shape. So I'm going to draw 10 coins on top of each of the pots. You can draw with me or you can just count with me. Let's get, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's go to the next pot and draw 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we have one more pot. We need ten coins. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, now we have our ten coins in each one. Now, I wonder what exactly the problem is asking though. The problem wants to know how many coins that I have in all. So, how do you think we could figure that out? Hmm. Do you have any ideas? Counting. That's a great idea. Let's count them all and see how many we have all together. Now, when I count these, I'm going to put a little mark on each one to make sure that I only count each one one time. And we're just going to keep counting till we get to the end. Let's see. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Now, I know that the last number I said is how many there are. How many were there? That's right. There were 30 coins in all. 30 coins. That's a lot of coins in those um, pots. So now, I want you to think, though. I wonder if there's an easier way to count to 30 without having to count each one of those individually or by themselves. What do you think I could do? Count by tens? You must be the smartest counters in the whole wide world. 
Let's try that and see if we get the same answer, if we count by tens. So we have 10, what comes next, 20, 30. Did we get the same answer? We got 30 counting by tens and we got 30 counting by ones. We got the same answer, wow, and look how much faster it was to count by tens. So today, we practice counting by ones and counting by tens all the way to 30. And we used a fun math problem to do it. Thank you so much for helping me solve my problem. And it was great seeing all of you again and having so many friends here with me. I hope you have a very good day. I'll see you next time. Bye for now. Hello, my name is Paula Vickers and I'm a St. Tammany Parish public school music teacher for grades four, five, and six. I'm so glad you could join me today in this lesson. We are going to experience music in nature. You really don't have to have a lot of supplies. I've gathered a couple of sticks to help me during this lesson. While you are outside gathering your sticks, or rocks or whatever you choose. Listen. Listen to the wind blow. If you live near the water, listen to the waves crash. Whatever you're around, listen to it in nature. Listen to the birds chirp. Quite often we miss out by just not listening, even in music. Before we get into making our music with our sticks or rocks. I just want to mention a couple of musicians or composers who have used nature in their music. One that should be very familiar to all of us is Louis Armstrong. Of course, he is from New Orleans and he's famous for singing the song, What a Wonderful World. Just a couple of the lyrics in there. I see trees of green, red roses too. The next verse begins, I see skies of blue and clouds of white. Look at all the color in nature. Then there was another composer named Claude Debussy or Debussy. It's acceptable to pronounce it both ways. He is what we call an impressionistic composer and he quite often composed music to paint a picture. In fact, if you look him up and study him, he wanted to be an artist. He's a music artist and a composer. But one song that he composed for vocal music is called Nuit de Toile, and it means starry night. Go outside and look at the stars some night and think about what it would sound like if he put it to music. He also has another piece for symphony called Le Mur. It's the sea. And imagine the waves crashing when you hear that. Well, today I wanna to teach you a song. Uh, it's called I Love the Mountains. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use the echo method. So I will sing a line and then you will sing it back with me. I will sing it with you the second time. So each line is going to be sung twice. I will sing it once and then I want you to join me on the second line, second time when we sing it. And then we will put, we will put the song together. I have the lyrics that I will hold up to this play for you. I love the mountains. Sing it with me. I love the mountains. I love the rolling hills. I love the rolling hills. I love the flowers. I love the flowers. I love the daffodils. I love the daffodils. I love the fireside. I love the fireside. When all the lights are low, when all the lights are low. And that's the first part of the song. When we get to the second part, it's more nonsense words. And we will talk about that in just a couple of minutes. But let's sing this campfire song. I love the mountains. <clears throat> sing it with me. I love the mountains. I love the rolling hills. I love the flowers. I love the daffodils, I love the fireside, when all the lights are low. 
and you can tell it doesn't sound like it ends. So we're going to put the ending in just a minute, but say this with me, boom diada, boom diada. And we're gonna sing that a bunch of times. Boom diada, 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 boom. I like to end it with a boom at the end. It's not really written that way, but I think it makes it kind of sound more finalized. So let's sing the entire song together. <clears throat> I love the mountains. I love the rolling hills. I love the flowers. I love the daffodils. I love the fireside when all the lights are low. Boom di ada, 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 boom. Now, what's really fun is if you sing that song through one time, and if you've got somebody there at your house that can join in, they could keep singing. Boom di ada, 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 boom, while you were singing the words, and it makes it pretty cool and interesting. Now, I decided to also go about changing the lyrics. We can change the lyrics. We call that composing when we change something about a song or doing a different arrangement. And I decided, let's think about Louisiana. What could we do and make it sound like a Louisiana song? Or maybe you want to talk about Louisiana food or something else. But since this is nature, I thought, what do I see in Louisiana? I haven't always lived here. So when you, when you move somewhere to a, like to a different place, a different town, a different uh, state, you see things differently. So some of the things that I noticed when I first moved to Louisiana about 20 years ago was the bayous, the big oak trees, the Spanish moss growing on the oak trees, the swamps and the lakes. And then the one thing I really love is the sunset glowing upon the lake. So I've taken those words and replaced some of the words that I taught you a few minutes ago. See if you can sing it with me. <clears throat> I love the bayous, I love the big oak trees, I love the Spanish moss, I love the swamps and lake, I love the sunsets glowing upon the lake. Boom di ada, 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 boom. Now, if you get really good at singing the song, you could do the boom di ada on something you found in nature. I have found two sticks in my yard under some trees. Boom di ada, 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 boom di ada. Now I'm gonna sing the original lyrics because I know those better than the ones I just wrote. And I'm gonna put my sticks with it. I love the mountains, I love the rolling hills, I love the flowers, I love the daffodils, I love the fireside when all the lights are low. Boom di ada, 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 boom. And you can make this anything you want. How fun with it. How fun creating, creating new music during this time. Before we leave, let's sing the one about Louisiana one more time. I love the bayous. I love the big oak trees. I love the Spanish moss. I love the swamps and lakes. I love the sunsets glowing upon the lake. Boom di ada, 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 boom di ada. Boom di ada, boom di ada, boom. Thank you so much for singing with me today. Thank you for watching as we have learned about music in nature. You did a great job. Remember to keep watching other videos like this one so we can all keep learning together. You can watch daily lessons on STPPS TV or on our website at stpsb.org. See you again soon.
Hi, I'm Brian Dial, St. Tammany Parish Public School System PE teacher. And today, for our lesson, I'd like to just teach you a few simple body weight exercises so that you can get a total body workout in your own home without any equipment. Now, I'm going to teach you a lower body, a core, and an upper body exercise, and then a variation of each one so that you can experiment to see which one fits your level of fitness best. When we're talking about personal fitness, remember, only you matter. Don't compare yourself to anyone else. Just work on making yourself better. Our first Every exercise day. is going to be the goblet squat. The goblet squat's named that because we're going to be holding our hands like we're holding a goblet or a cup. I like to teach the goblet squat so that we learn to keep our body in an upright position because you don't want to spill the water out of the goblet. So the first thing you do is you stand about shoulder width apart. Your toes can either point straight forward or outward a little bit. Imagine if it's a clock, instead of having your toes on the 12s, have them point one at the 11 and one at the one o'clock, so your feet are pointed out a little bit. And if you're taller, your feet might be a little wider than shoulder width. Find what's comfortable for you. Now we're gonna hold our hands like a goblet, like we're holding a cup of water so we don't spill it. And then we're gonna slowly bend our knees until our tops of our legs are parallel with the floor if we can get that low while keeping our feet flat. If not, bend your knees as far as you can go while keeping your feet flat and your back straight. Let's watch right here, going down nice and slow. Nice and slow. Let's look from the side, you'll see the key to the goblet squat is that the very first movement your hip makes is backwards. You don't go down first, it's back. Watch my hip right here. The very first thing it's gonna do as I start is go backward and then down. Backward and then down. That's the goblet squat. Feet shoulder width apart. Hands holding your goblet so we don't spill the water. Toes straight forward or pointed out a little bit. Slowly bend your knees so that you can keep your feet flat and go down to the top of your legs are parallel with the floor. Another variation of a lower body exercise is the split squat. In the split squat, we're gonna be working one leg at a time, so it's a little bit tougher. You need to stand so that your feet are on what we call different train tracks. Your feet are not behind each other. One of them is on this side of an imaginary line, the other one is on the other side of the imaginary line. They're both still about shoulder width apart, maybe a little more narrow. Your back foot is going to be up on its toe. Your front foot stays flat, and the secret to the split squat is that we go straight down. We're not going to drive our front knee forward, we're going to drive our hips straight down so that our back knee gets close to the ground, like this. Down, and then up down and then up. Let's watch from the side. You'll see again, this time my hip goes straight down. I've already opened it up by stepping backwards. Down and then up. Down. Notice this front knee is not going forward. It's staying straight over its ankle. That's the split squat. That's a little tougher variation of a lower body exercise. Now we're going to move to the upper body. First upper body exercise I'm going to teach you is the push-up. It's important to remember three things when we're doing our basic push-up. First, your hands should be under your shoulders and a little wider than shoulder width. We don't want our hands way out in front of our body. We don't want our hands behind our shoulders. Second, we want to keep a nice straight line from the head, through the neck, through the shoulders, our torso, through our hips, through our legs, through our knees and our ankles of our body. Nice straight line. We don't want our back to arch up like a teepee. We don't want our back to be curved like a seal. Third, we need to raise and lower our body like an elevator as one unit. We don't want part of the elevator to go up while the other part of the elevator stays down. Let's watch and see. Right. Hands underneath your shoulders. Eyes looking straight down at the ground in between your hands. Don't look at your toes. That'll make your back arch up. And we just slowly lower and raise. One unit. Nice and smooth. 
nice and smooth. That was our basic push-up. Now, if you're not able to do a basic push-up, one modification you can do is called the negative push-up. With the negative push-up, we're only working on the lowering. Everything else stays the same. So we're going to get our hands under our shoulders, get our good straight line, and then we're just going to slowly bend our arms, go down, and when we can't hold it anymore, just relax. Then get back up to our position, slowly bend our elbows, and when we get down, just relax and get back up to our position. Using the negative push-up allows you to work out at your level of fitness. One more modification you can do if you're not able to perform the basic push-up is what we call a knee push-up. When we do a knee push-up, we still want to keep our straight line from our head through our shoulders, our body, to our hips, to our knees. But we're going to take our feet up off the ground to make ourselves a little lighter and able to handle the weight. So here, I will get in my knee push-up position. Notice there's still a straight line. And then I just bend and straight. And bend and straight. Nice, easy elbow movements. Notice my whole body moves like a teeter-totter. That's the knee push-up. Now let's move to the core. The first exercise I'm going to teach you is called the plank. Just like a plank of wood, our objective is to keep our body perfectly straight. We're going to support our weight with our forearms and our toes. Everything else is being held off of the ground using our core muscles. We want to keep our eyes looking straight down at the ground, not up and not down at your toes, because that's going to cause our plank to have a curve to it. Let's hold this for about 10 seconds. We're going to start. Let's put my forearms on the ground, toes on the ground, nice and tight. Two, three, four, five. Hold it. Six, good. Eight, nine, ten. The plank is a simple exercise, but if you start to hold it for longer and longer periods of time, you're definitely going to feel it in your core. Our last exercise I'm going to teach you is the Superman. In Superman, we're going to use our core and a little bit of our upper back to pull our arms and legs up off of the ground. First thing I'm going to do is lay here on my belly, arms outstretched, feet outstretched, just like I was flying, and then I'm going to use my upper back and core muscles to pull my hands and feet off the ground, hold it, four, Five, relax. Two, three, four. Hold it. Two, three, four. Relax. Two, three, four. That's the Superman. Now we're going to put it all together in a total body workout. We're going to use a descending pyramid rep scheme, which means we're going to do four of each exercise, then three, then two, then one, so it's going to get a little bit easier each time. You guys ready to go? Alright, you can choose whichever the exercise that you like. I'm going to go ahead and choose whichever ones I like and follow along. Let's start with our lower body. Four lower body. You're going to do split squat, alternate. Ready? And let's go. Four. Three. Two. One. Now upper body, push-ups, four, three, two, one. Now let's do Superman. If you choose plank, just hold it for 10 seconds. Four, three, two, one. Now we're back up. Goblet squats again. Remember, feet shoulder width. Hold the water, hips back first. Three, two, one. Now we'll go ahead and do our negatives. Three, two, 
three, two, one. We do some more Superman. Three, two, one. Let's go ahead. Go split squat now. Push up coming. What? Two. Let's go ahead and hold our plank now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Last round. Come on, you can do it. Great job! Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed our fitness lesson and remember to watch more videos like this so we can all keep learning together. Lessons like this can be seen daily on the St. Tammany Parish television channel or on the school board website. Have a great day! Okay, here goes our first math strategy that we learned. We started with adding numbers such as 12 plus 5. And one of our strategies was to draw it out using quick tens and ones. So we would take the number 12, and we know we have one ten and two ones. And then we also have 5, and we like to draw it using X's. So we would draw 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 X's. Count it all up where we have 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, which would make our answer 17. Another strategy that we used using 12 plus 5 was to take both of the 1s and to block it off and add up the 1s. 2 plus 5 gave me 7. We have one 10 left over, so it was really 10 plus 7, which gave us 17. Now, remember, we can only use this strategy if the two-digit number comes before the one-digit number. If it's two-digit by two-digit, we can't do it. Or if it was a one-digit first, then the two-digit, we couldn't do it because it wouldn't have made sense. This is the only way we could do this strategy. The other strategy that we had using 12 plus 5 was to break apart our 12 into the 10s and the 1s. 
10 and 2. We would add up our 1s, 5 plus 2 gave me 7, and then we would add up the 10 plus 7 to give us 17. We learned a lot of really cool strategies with this. Now, when we go on to a two-digit plus a two-digit number, When we go on to a two digit plus a two digit number, such as 17 plus 20, we learned that if any number that ends in a zero, that means we're adding a group of tens. So we're only gonna look at the tens place. So we underline the tens place in both of the numbers and add them up first. The one plus the two gave me three, and the seven stays the same because if I have zero ones to add to it, I'm gonna keep the number the exact same. Or you can use drawing it out. Drawing it out is always a great strategy. One ten and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ones plus 20 gave me 10, 20, 30, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 37. Drawing it out is always the best strategy to go to. But here, is your brand new math strategy that we're going to show you. It is called Old School Way or Vertical Addition. So we're going to take an addition problem such as 22 plus 14. We're going to be adding some really big numbers here, okay? So Ms. Bowden wants to show you real quick, you can still draw it out, 20, 2, and 14, it gives you 10, 20, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36. It still gives us 36. Or we can still do the number bond strategy by breaking 20 and 2. But this time, instead of, you can add it to 14 and do 20 plus 16, or you can break apart the 14 and do 10 and four, and then add up your tens. 20 plus 10 gave you 30, and two plus four gives you six, which gives you 36. It's a lot of steps and a lot of work, but let's take that same problem and do it the vertical way. 22 plus 14. So here's what we wanna do. We wanna take the first number and we wanna write it out. Then I'm gonna take my second number and I'm gonna line it up. So what Ms. Bowden likes to do is I like to draw a line to separate my tens and my ones. So when I go to write my next number down, 14, I can put my ones under my ones and my tens under my tens. So in 14, there are four ones. I'm gonna put the four under the two because that's my ones and the one ten under the two tens. Now I can look at it and I can see everything is lined up. So what we do is we put the plus sign and this line down here means equal. So instead of writing it across saying 22 plus 14 equals, we're saying 22 plus 14 and that line means equals. This line right here is really kind of imaginary, but Ms. Bowden likes you to draw it out right now to make sure that when you write it up and down, you're lining up your place value. Now, in math class, when we start doing this old school way, what we're gonna do is you always wanna start with the ones. We, you know how you read left to right? Well, when math time comes and you do big problems like this, we work backwards from the smallest all the way up to the biggest. Because remember when we learned 10 ones turns into a 10 and so we're bundling it up. So what we wanna do is always start with those ones. So we're gonna add up just the ones. Two plus four and that's gonna give me four, five, six. That's gonna give me six. Now I go over to the tens and I add up the tens. Two tens plus one ten gives me three tens and my answer is 36. Same answer that we got using all these other strategies as well. Let's try one more. Let's do the problem 31 plus 
27. Big numbers right there. So the first step, think about what you're gonna do. That's right, write 31. Then the next step is to draw that imaginary line to separate our place values. Okay, where am I gonna put the plus sign? That's right, on the next line where I'm gonna write the next number. And what's my next number I'm gonna write? 27, good job. Now let's line it up. Let's put our ones under our ones and our tens under our tens. And then we draw this line right here, which means what? Very good, equal sign. Okay, so now which side do we start on? Do we start adding on the tens or do we start adding on the ones? Yes, we start adding on the one side. Very good, so let's add them up. One plus seven gives me Good job, eight. And then let's add up our tens. Three tens plus two tens gives me, very good, five tens. So our answer for 31 plus 27 is the number 58. Great job, guys, way to go. Now, I'm gonna give you some more problems to try at home on your own. Parents, this is all without regrouping. Next week on Monday, I will post a video about regrouping. So here's your worksheet that you're gonna do. I am going to take a picture of this worksheet and post it in the comments so you have it for yourself. Have a good time solving. Send me your answers when you're finished. Hello. My name is Mrs. Andy, and I'm a pre-K teacher for St. Tammany Parish School Board. Thank you for joining me today. We'll be learning about our capital letters. Please repeat after me. Looks like a barn where we put the hay. The first letter we say is the letter A. What letter is this, guys? That's right, the letter A. <clears throat> Looks like two bumps or wings of a bee. What letter is this guy? That's right, the letter B. Looks like a moon. When we look in the sky, we can see the moon. What letter is that guys? That's right, the letter C. Looks like it has a big belly. This letter ate too much dessert. What letter is this, guys? That's right, the letter D. Count the lines. One, two, three. The letter E. <clears throat> what letter is this, guys? That's right. The letter E. <clears throat> Looks like a flag. A flag blowing in the breeze. What letter is that, guys? That's right, the letter F. <clears throat> G. It looks like this letter has a hole in it. Like a pair of jeans. What letter is this? That's right, the letter G. Looks like a board going across the middle. We need to karate chop that. What letter is this? That's right, the letter H. Looks like my finger. My finger points to my eye. What letter is this? That's right, the letter I. Looks like two wings and a beak like a blue jay. What letter is this? That's right, the letter J. <clears throat> Looks like this letter has a cave. What letter is this? 
That's right, the letter K. <clears throat> Looks like a line down and a tongue out. What letter is this? That's right, the letter L. Looks like mountains. Who will be climbing those mountains? I am. What letter is this? That's right, the letter M. Looks like my road. My house is at the N. What letter is this? That's right, the letter N. Looks like the shape of your mouth. When you see something amazing, you say, oh, wow. What letter is this? That's right, the letter O. <clears throat> this letter looks like it has a little belly. This letter only eats peas. What letter is this? That's right, the letter P. Looks like an O or a balloon with a line going through it. Pop through it to make a Q. What letter is this? That's right, the letter Q. Looks like a pirate with a peg leg. Pirates say R. What letter is this? That's right, the letter R. Looks like a snake. A snake says S. What letter is this? That's right. The letter S. Looks like you can grab the top and stir a cup of tea. What letter is this? That's right, the letter T. Looks like a smiley face. A smiley face just like you. What letter is this? That's right, the letter U. Looks like an arrow pointing to the floor. We use a vacuum to clean the floor. What letter is this? That's right, the letter V. <clears throat> Looks like three heads for duck, duck, goose, W. What letter is this? That's right, W. Looks like an X on a treasure map. X marks the spot. What letter is this? That's right, the letter X. This line looks like a slide, but you can't go down it. You might ask why. Looks like a line across and a stripe down. A stripe on a zebra. What letter is this? That's right, the letter Z. Thank you for joining me today as we learned about our capital letters. Check back at stpsb.org or stpstv for more vid videos where we can learn together. See you soon. Bye.